Hi, Doug. Hi, Will. How are you? I'm fine. Came down from Princeton at 4.30 in the morning, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> 4.30 in the morning. Wow. Uh, you must be uh, uh, running on steam or running on adrenaline or something like that, right? Well, I'm fully caffeinated. Uh, for the uh, benefit of our viewers, uh, can you uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell them uh, who you are and what you do? Uh, my name is Doug Massey. I'm a professor of sociology and public affairs at Princeton University, which means I'm jointly appointed in the sociology department and in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs there at Princeton. Excellent. And I am Will Wilkinson uh, at the Cato Institute. We are filming here at the Cato Institute today. Uh, uh, I don't know if Doug imagined that he'd uh, be sequestered away in one of the uh, frightening uh, warrens at uh, Cato, but uh, we have you in our clutches now, and so you have to talk with us for an hour. Okay, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you, uh, Doug, uh, uh, because I have just recently read your new book, uh, Categorically Unequal. I'm holding it up to the uh, camera here. Uh, Categorically Unequal, the American Stratification System. Uh, I'm working on a paper on inequality currently, uh, and uh, I have a, uh, a, a you know, skeptical libertarian approach to uh, the, why inequality is important. I think a lot of times sort of nominal uh, inequality, income inequality, is overblown as an issue relative to the importance of things like, uh, like income mobility, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the capacity of everyone in society to have a fair chance to uh, you know participate in the economy. And reading your book, I found a, a really compelling set of explanations for uh, you know mechanisms of exclusion and stratification that I think are really important and worth caring about. Uh, so the the beginning of your book, you talk about uh, how stratification works, um, and I think you're drawing largely on. Uh, who is it? Is it Charles Tilley? Charles Tilley. I draw heavily on his work. Yeah, and can you tell us uh, a little bit about some of the mechanisms uh, that uh, that that uh, underlie the stratification of society on economic and social uh, categories? Yeah, um, stratification didn't suddenly come into existence with uh, the emergence of market economies and capitalism in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, stratification is a very old process that goes back to the first urban civilizations in the United States. Hunting and gathering groups aren't that stratified, uh, but once you get into an urban-based civilization, uh, st mechanisms of stratification emerge. And from 10,000 years ago to the present, really, there are two basic mechanisms of stratification. Uh, the first one is what uh, Charles Tilley calls uh, opportunity hoarding, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, another way of saying an exclusion, where a, a group uh, gains uh, social control over uh, a resource and then excludes others from access to it and either prevents them from accessing it or uh, 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 allows them uh, access only if they pay monopoly rents. And so uh, that's uh, one of the fundamental mechanisms uh, of exclusion. And uh, uh, I'm blocking on the other one. Uh, is it a to me. exploitation? Exploitation, yes. Exploitation is basically uh, the second mechanism of exclusion. And uh, exploitation uh, basically involves setting up a social mechanism that uh, uh, puts people to work and then pays them for much less than the value uh, that their labor produces. Uh, the ultimate form of exploitation, of course, is slavery, where you pay them nothing and you pay them only what's required to keep them alive and working another day. Uh, uh, less severe forms of exploitation uh, involve uh, Jim Crow-type uh, uh, discrimination in the United States where you systematically paid black and white workers uh, different amounts of money uh, only because of, uh, of the color of their skin and irrespective of the value uh, that their labor produced. And uh, unfortunately, uh, discrimination continues to be a, a, a salient process in American markets today. So these are the two basic uh, uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms of, of uh, 
of uh, stratification in virtually all societies, whether they're full-blown market societies or command economies or pre-market societies. It's basically uh, the m uh, mechanisms of stratification involve one or another uh, social uh, constructions, uh, institutions, that produce uh, exploitation and uh, opportunity hoarding or exclusion. Can you tell me, uh, you, you, you also described the processes, uh, the, the way these things get sort of generalized throughout society. I think the me mechanisms mentioned are, uh, or what, what were they called, emulation and adaptation. Uh, so ha can you say a little bit about that, how these sort of uh, structures well, propagate? Well, once these um, structures come into existence and are functioning as stratifying agents, uh, then they can be copied. Uh, and other people can uh, copy them to uh, set up their own stratifying uh, systems that benefit uh, their particular social group. So that's a process of emulation, where one social group in one society sees how stratification is functioning in another one and, and simply copies it. The other one is uh, emulation, where, uh, uh, whereby... Um, uh, it's, a, it's not emulation. It's a adaptation? Emulation. Adaptation. I'm sorry, I guess I did get up too early. Uh, adaptation, where uh, people realize the existence of these stratifying mechanisms and uh, adapt their behavior accordingly. So uh, if you know that there's a racially stratified society uh, and you as an individual can't change the racial stratification, then you adapt your behavior to to uh, assume this stratification system uh, exists and try to maximize your own uh, benefit within it. So for a, a, a person in a minority group, it involves marrying whiter people, trying to uh, improve the race through marriage to uh, the dominant group. Uh, and uh, that's basically saying, okay, it's a racist society, but I'm going to try to marry whiter to make sure my kids have lighter skin to be able to uh, improve their life chances in this racially stratified world. Uh, so I was just reading a uh, I was just reading a novel by uh, V. S. Naipaul. Uh, I think it's called Half a Life. And one of the it's set in London in the 1960s, I believe. And one of the characters is a uh, uh, I think this particular character was uh, from the uh, uh, the West Indies, and his aspiration was to uh, have white grandchildren. Yeah, and it's a very it's a very common uh, uh, adaptation in uh, colonial societies and uh, and uh, in immigrant societies as well. Uh, and V.S. Nepal's a master at uh, exploring these kind of uh, complex uh, motivations in stratified societies. Now, what, one other thing that I, I found very useful uh, as a schema for understanding. Uh, uh, stratification and discrimination and exclusion, you uh, uh, introduce a uh, um, uh, something called the stereo stereotype content model, uh, which has like two dimensions, the warmth and competence dimension. And, and, and I found this, like after reading this, it seems kind of like a simplistic model uh, at, at first glance. So uh, one dimension is uh, how warmly people of that group are, are, uh, are received or, uh, you know, how warm they are how you feel about them. Um, and the other dimension is how sort of competent or incompetent you think you are, they are. And those two dimensions actually do combine to to uh, uh, seemingly uh, explain a lot. So like, you know, the low warmth, low competence uh, groups are, uh, are classified as the despised out group. Uh, the, you know, people that you don't like very much but you think are very competent are the sort of envied out group. You know, the people who you like but you think that they're kind of stupid, they're, you know, pitied, uh, and, they, you know, and then the, everybody would like to think that they're in the sort of top right corner, the, uh, uh, the you know, warmly received and competent, that would be the esteemed in-group. Uh, and, right. and, 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 and I actually found that re quite useful when thinking about the uh, sort of different groups that you end up talking about through the books, uh, to, through the book. so uh, uh, African-Americans, uh, immigrants of various uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, uh, different conceptions of women in society. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say to expand on that, but I, I, I just wanted to put that out there as a, one of the schemas in the book that I found helpful. Well, um, as human beings, um, we're programmed to think categorically. So when we think about the world, the way we think intelligently about the world is by setting up categories and classifying 
um, things, objects, people into these categories, and then uh, understanding the relationships between the categories and understanding the meaning, the content of the various categories. That's how we think as human beings. And of course, uh, the most important environment to which uh, human beings adapt is the social environment. So social cognition is fundamental to what it means to be a human being. So we're constantly going around and putting people into social categories. And uh, uh, the stereotype content model is a way of understanding how people perceive social others in a, in a very simplified social space. that turns out to have a lot of predictive power and a lot of uh, generalizability across different cultures. It's been verified in a variety of different settings at this point. Mm -hmm. So basically... Uh, whenever we meet somebody uh, uh, and we place them in a social category and we recognize them as a social other, uh, we evaluate them uh, consciously or unconsciously on the basis of two basic dimensions. Uh, one is uh, uh, how warm they are. Are they approachable? Are they people that we might like to be with? Uh, how uh, warm do we feel towards them? And the other dimension is how competent are they? Uh, irrespective of warmth, are they the kinds of people that can get things done, that have an instrumental action, that can uh, accomplish uh, things in the social world? And uh, we're basically, uh, the two-dimensional space that results from the intersection of warmth and competence produces a map of social cognition. Uh, and, of course, people that are warm and competent that's me. That's us. That's the in-group. And people like us. So yeah. we tend to place people that uh, we perceive as like us in the warm and competent uh, space. Uh, then, But this yields three different kinds of out-groups. So on mm -hmm. the one hand, there's the envied out-group that are not warm, but they're very competent. And historically... Uh, these groups tend to be uh, the middlemen minorities in multi-ethnic societies. So Jews in medieval Europe, the ethnic Chinese in Malaysia or East Africa. These are competent people uh, to whom you uh, defer uh, in a stable social structure, but you don't find them particularly warm and you don't necessarily like them. And what happens is when you end up with an unstable social structure or a breakdown in social structure, uh, oftentimes you end up with genocide uh, yeah. because the constraints Constraints are suddenly removed, and you attack these people. Uh, the other uh, combination, one of the other combinations, is uh, high warmth but low competence. And these uh, are people that we pity. These, these are the pitied out groups. And classic uh, uh, social groups that fall into this space would be uh, the mentally retarded, uh, the elderly, the, the infirm. Uh, people that you feel sorry for, that you realize that for the grace of God you might be there. But the lovable really not loser category, the lovable loser category. You the know, deserving yeah. poor, the people yeah. that uh, didn't get there through any uh, fault of their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a normal social structure, a stable social structure, we have mechanisms to, to care for them, um, uh, both through families and through uh, state structures and uh, broader societal institutions and so on. Uh, but when there's a social breakdown, these people can also suffer, as we saw in, in Hurricane Katrina, where there was a complete breakdown of the social order, and the ones who suffered the most were basically people in these pity data groups who, mm -hmm. who were very vulnerable. And then um, the, the very interesting category of outgroup are people who are uh, neither warm nor competent, and those are the despised outgroups, the outgroups that uh, we don't like and we don't see as competent. And falling into this category are, are groups like uh, drug dealers, uh, addicts, uh, the homeless, uh, people that uh, we really despise socially. Now, um, uh, for any uh, social group, uh, where you fall in the social space is not preordained. It's a socially right. defined process. And so if you're trying to set up a stratification system and you, uh, you want to victimize uh, social others, then um, your job is to try to get uh, through a series of labeling processes and social definition processes and boundary-making processes to move that, cat that social group from the category of esteemed in-group, people like us mm -hmm. that are more incompetent, down towards that uh, uh, other quadrant of yeah. despised out-group. If they're no longer warm and no longer competent, then you can exploit them. And you can do so uh, at a, a fairly fundamental level with a great deal of impunity and not feel bad about it. Yeah, I think I, this, this helped me sort of conceptualize what's going on in some 
some kinds of of culture war issues that that there's th- these there are these wars over these boundaries and categories and where you're going to put them. So for some reason, I always draw on this uh, on the uh, on the sitcom uh, Will and Grace, say as a as a uh, as a uh, a sally in the uh, culture war, partly because it was uh, part, it seemed like part of what it does by having a one of the leads be a a very sympathetic, warm, gay character. Uh, is to sort of like move uh, the, the sort of average American's conception of a homosexual man up the warmth dimension. But it was also uh, it was also uh, important that in that show, Will was a uh, high-paid corporate lawyer as well. Uh, so it, it, the, the whole show, the sort of edging people like Will, you know, rhetorically or through the through the through the mechanisms of the drama toward the esteemed in group. Quadrant, and it also like through the um, it, when, when thinking about issues about uh, uh, women's equality uh, in, in in your book, you have the uh, stereotype content model applied to like different female uh, right. stereotypes, mm-hmm. and and I, and I found that really compelling. That that down at the, at the in the uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, the competent but not warm. Like way down in warmth is like the career woman or the feminist, uh, and, right. and 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 that just seemed to apply directly to the current presidential race, where Hillary Clinton has to really fight this idea that everybody thinks she's competent. I think she's 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 locked that in. She's got that, um, but the, the the complaint is that she's icy. Uh, she's not. Uh, you know, she doesn't project this sort of like nurturing thing so like the housewife is in the opposite quadrant the housewife is the uh is the uh is is very warm but not competent uh, and and it's and it's like a very difficult dance for a, a woman who's seeking a political power to play where you have to I, you, i'm sure you remember when she got uh you know during bill clinton's presidency where she said something uh I forget exactly what it was, but about you know contributing cookie recipes to uh, right. a major woman's magazine, and she got pilloried for not playing this game of the woman being domestic, uh, and that that reduced people. And so she she's very careful to now contribute cookie recipes to women's magazines, uh, lest she be seen as incredibly unsympathetic. But that shows you how the sort of the the structure of people's expectations really limits like what her strategy can be. Yes, um, stereotyping is uh, very much linked to what goes on in the popular media, and television has this huge effect. So when you can see a sympathetic character uh, uh, who's gay and and competent, it it makes a big difference in in, uh, people's social perceptions. Uh, The interesting thing uh, about gender is that uh, even if you want to exploit women, uh, and you want to set up uh, mechanisms of exploitation and exclusion that will uh, preserve uh, male privileges, uh, you can't put women very easily down in that category of the despised out group because at the end of the day, uh, men and women come home to the same households, everybody has a mother, everybody, most people have sisters, brothers, you have to interact. And so this leaves uh, uh, only two other possible stereotypes. Uh, so you kind of get the feminist, anti-feminist stereotype of the cold-hearted bitch, and then uh, at the other extreme you get the very warm and loving housewife who's just not too good with numbers and, and really belongs in the home. Yeah. Uh, but, but you don't find uh, very often uh, a, a very a strong stereotype uh, of women as the despised outgroup. Mm-hmm. So let's 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 step back into into some of the the mechanisms of of stratification. There were just two others that I wanted to touch on uh, as background. Uh, the first is various notions of capital, and the second is is uh, is, is physical segregation and uh, and uh, sort of spatial removal. So first, let's talk a little bit about different forms of capital that can. Uh, underlie inequalities. So there's, of course, just economic capital, but there's also human capital, social capital, and cultural capital. And can you say a little bit about those things? Well, capital is one of the resources that you exclude people from to hoard, or uh, or you discriminate in the production of. Uh, So uh, the question is, what is capital? Well, we're all familiar with the idea of financial capital, money, and financial instruments, and physical capital, uh, machines, houses, and things like that. Uh, But uh, 
uh, over the years, economists and uh, social sociologists have expanded the concept of capital. Capital is basically anything that is useful in a productive process. And the first expansion were by, was by um, uh, economists at the University of Chicago in the 1950s, and their idea was human capital. That is, it's not simply finance, it's not simply machines, but it's knowledge and skills which are very important in the productive process. And, and economists have come to widely recognize the centrality of, hu- of human capital and human capital production in the form of education and skill cultivation uh, to the productive process in a globalized uh, information mm-hmm. economy. Uh, it was the sociologists who uh, took it uh, then again a step further and talked about social capital. And social capital is instrumental value that comes from social organization or social networks. So uh, uh, social ties between people were uh, as, as human beings, we're all enmeshed in social networks. We have friends, we have kin, uh, we have a variety of different kinds of associates. And uh, those social ties may or may not be useful to us in, in performing some productive task or achieving some end. Whenever a social tie becomes useful in providing resources to achieve a uh, uh, a desired end, then it constitutes a source of social capital. Yeah, so when people talk about like an old boys network, they're talking about uh, a, a, a form of, you know, very exclusive social capital, that there's a bunch of members of this club who are able to uh, uh, give privileges to one another, give opportunities to one another that are, aren't available to other people. And, uh, and the, the idea of old boys networks is that it's very, very hard to break into them. And that's, that's kind of a, you know, what I think of as the sort of cartoon version of the advantages of social capital. Yeah, social capital stems from connections between people and um, uh, networks, uh, uh, old boy networks are one uh, hoary example of, of how this works. In my yeah. own work on, on immigration, mm-hmm. uh, you can see migrant networks working as a source of social capital. Yeah. So if you're in a poor town in Mexico, you know the United States uh, uh, has a lot of opportunities, but you may or may not be able to access them. And mm-hmm. if you're the first one to leave from your community, it's a daunting prospect to, uh, to go up and cross the border and find a job and so on. Mm-hmm. But uh, once somebody from your community is migrated, then you get access to social capital. So you know somebody who who knows their way around, who knows how to get across the border, maybe even has contact with an employer who's looking for work. So you draw on that social tie, and that gives you access to the U.S. labor market. So social capital is very important in, in uh, chain migration and network formation. Mm-hmm. It's really a process of social capital formation through migrant networks. Yeah, we were just talking uh, before this about my, uh, my home town, Marshalltown, Iowa, uh, and, uh, and and that sort of uh, mechanism seems to play a real function in migration to Marshalltown. There's a huge uh, meatpacking plant there, which is the uh, the Swift meatpacking plant, I think it is, uh, that is the uh, uh, main uh, employer in uh, Marshalltown, and it's full of Mexican immigrants, and job opportunities there are advertised back in uh, this one community in Mexico, most ever, all of the uh, Mexicans in Marshalltown come from the same town in Mexico, uh, and so it's not a random assortment of Mexicans finding their way to this particular t- small town in Iowa. It's that they're make- taking advantage of this one particular social network that sort of draws them through the process. Yeah, and uh, that's a very old and a very common story. If you read The Polish Peasant, uh, written by W.I. Thomas in 1919, uh, he found the same sort of uh, social networks connecting small villages in Poland to the to, to neighborhoods in the south side of Chicago and to mm-hmm. opportunities in meatpacking plants on the south side of Chicago. So it's a, it's a fundamental process uh, to all immigration streams, and immigration is very much a process of social capital formation through networks, uh, which you observe in the connection between Marshalltown and, and uh, I think, ascending community somewhere in the Mexican state of Guanajuato. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me a little bit about cultural capital. This seems to me the most sort of ephemeral and hard to put, hardest to put your finger on, but, uh, but I think it's a, a, the notion of cultural capital is, uh, is definitely identifiable to any sort of... Uh, so anybody who went through like a hipsterish uh, music phase, where there's certain bands that you're supposed to like, and certain you know artists that you're supposed to like, and being able to talk about those things signals a kind of social status in a very subtle way. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that? 
Well, both um, human capital and cultural capital involve knowledge. Mm-hmm. So, um, and you go to school and you learn things like uh, arithmetic and math and uh, and writing, and you learn science and technology and so on. And those are hard skills that you put to use mm-hmm. uh, and make you more productive. Uh, and they'll make you productive in a very basic sense. Uh, cultural capital are things that are not directly related to your productivity as a worker or uh, as as a participant in a productive process, but rather they help you navigate a certain social uh, environment where the production occurs. So when you go to a place like Princeton, for example, you get a first-class education and you mm-hmm. learn uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of basic uh, things that are very valuable uh, and make you a produ- more productive member of society. But at the same time, you, uh, you go to Princeton, you learn a lot of cultural references yeah. and you learn how to speak. You learn how to um, uh, to talk, make small talk at a cocktail party. You learn uh, all these little cultural cues that make it easy for you to glide through uh, uh, elite boardrooms and elite settings. Uh, and that's cultural capital. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not really that they help you. You're not necessarily a better programmer, but right. if you get a job at the upper echelons of a, of a company, you can you know how to manipulate the, the social grease to, to get things going, and you can make small talk with people and feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's cultural capital. And all these forms of capital are important in, in, for people in navigating um, through their lives. And th- if you can establish systems of exploitation and opportunity hoarding that, uh, that control access and restrict access to uh, these various forms of capital, or you can get people to produce these various forms of capital and not pay them for it, then you've got a pretty good system of stratification. Uh, so let, let's one more uh, background thing. You've done a lot of work on on uh, on uh, spatial segregation, uh, a, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about how these various mechanisms work together to keep people from different classes basically physically apart from one another, and how that reinforces and helps reproduce the structure of uh, of uh, of stratification? Well, one of the most basic. Uh, mechanisms of exclusion is spatial. And um, I wrote a book in 1993 called American Apartheid. And uh, I I used the the metaphor of apartheid very deliberately. Um, When South African whites set up the apartheid government in 1948, one of the first things they passed was something called the Group Areas Act. And they wanted to restrict uh, whites to certain uh, areas of the country that were very advantageous, that had good schools, that were capable of producing a lot of social capital and human capital and, and cultural capital, and then exclude blacks into other areas that lacked all these resources and benefits. So segregation the, of people into different uh, 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 geographically defined communities is a very efficient and very effective exclusionary mechanism for restricting people's access to resources. And uh, you see in the United States a long history of racial segregation where African Americans are confined to much less disadvantaged residential environments than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And we see a rising uh, level of class segregation in the United States with a a growing concentration of affluent, uh, spatial concentration of affluence and a growing spatial concentration of, of poverty. Uh, so that if you live in an affluent area, you can uh, have a high property values, uh, have high incomes, uh, you have low demands for social services, so you can tax yourself at low rates and uh, and produce very nice uh, service deliveries. Uh, but if you live in a, a, a area of concentrated poverty, there's no there's not much wealth there. There's n- no property values. If you're going to provide services and the services are really in demand because these are poor people, you have to tax yourself at extremely high rates to. Uh, and as long as you've separated those two, uh, mm-hmm. there's no transfer between them. So uh, segregation is one of the most, one of the oldest and most effective exclusionary mechanisms. Uh, great. So, so the, I, I, now reading all of that, uh, I was, I, I felt, uh, I, I was, I found it quite enlightening because what partly what I, my complaint when I'm encountering uh, uh, discussions of inequality from the left is that I see. Um, the, uh, some lamentation over the increase in uh, nominal inequality and income inequality as if it's self-evident 
that that's a problem. Um, it's not self-evident to me that the growth in nominal inequality is a problem. Uh, what, uh, because I want to know, because it seems like there are uh, a number of different mechanisms that can give rise to the same Gini coefficient, to the same uh, sort of ratio between the incomes of the people in the lowest decile and the top decile. And what really matters is the mechanism that's generating that. And so w reading about all of these different processes uh, of, of, of stratification uh, really gave me a better idea of, of, the, of, of the mechanisms of inequality in a way that I found uh, um, lacking in a lot of uh, discussions of income inequality, as if we just, to the fact that some people have more is supposed to upset us. I don't think that's upsetting as long as that, uh, the, the inequality uh, doesn't embody any kind of injustice. Um, but when you're talking about these kinds of sort of spatial segregation uh, that uh, systematically excludes some people from opportunities to, uh, to participate fully in the uh, economy and its benefits, then that's obviously a real concern. So what I wanted to talk to you a little more about is then the relationship, uh, what you see as the relationship between these kinds of mechanisms and the uh, growth of inequality, uh, uh, sort of nominal inequality over the last, uh, you know, couple decades in the U.S. So part of, in part of your discussion, you talk about uh, the phase of what you call egalitarian capitalism in the middle of the century and how that seems to have broken down. Um, one of the reasons I have questions about that for you is that, that you give what I think of as a fairly conventional account of the change, the sort of macroeconomic structural changes, uh, structural not in, in the social sense but in the sort of just a, uh, economic structure. So we've had uh, huge, you know, big changes in technology. The computer revolution has increased productivity for certain kinds of well-educated workers faster than less well-educated workers. There's been an increase in globalization so, uh, and, and so competition from low-wage workers abroad uh, will tend to, uh, you know, on, on the surface it may seem like it's going to uh, cause price competition more at the lower end of wages. Uh, and you talk about the fragmentation of consumer markets and all of these very um, large-scale macroeconomic structural uh, changes uh, have given rise to uh, increasing benefits to being a, a high human capital, well-educated person. And, and there's a kind of uh, a fairly conventional account in economics about uh, uh, human capital uh, increases in the gains to human capital being the main story behind rising income inequality. Um, and I wasn't seeing exactly how... Now, that doesn't seem obviously bad, right? If, if, if the returns to education are increasing, then that's just an incentive for more people to become educated, uh, and we just want to make sure that everybody has access to those opportunities. Um, but just in itself, uh, there being higher returns to education and uh, to the attainment of human capital aren't necessarily concerning. So I'm interested in hearing more from you about how you think this sort of new inequality plays in with these different structural factors? Well, I don't that was, think... That was a long way to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You raised a lot of different issues. Yeah. Um, for, to start at the beginning, uh, I, I agree with you that inequality in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, uh, what you want to make sure is that you set up a, a political economy where a mobility is widespread and possible, and where people have equal access to the inputs that are required to participate in, 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 in the market. Uh, and I think uh, uh, inequality basically in, uh, uh, is, it indicates uh, at some level the degree to which those things are happening. So I do think that it can be uh, that too much inequality is a, a bad thing and too little inequality is a bad thing, and, and the trick is to try to somehow get it right. And my own view right now is that we've gone too far in the direction of excessive inequality. And that this actually causes macroeconomic problems because if you don't have enough income in, in, in the great middle class, uh, uh, then uh, you're going to have a hard time sustaining the demand that's required to keep the, the keep the economy moving forward. You don't want all the buying power concentrated in a very small share of the of the income distribution. So I think that it it, it, it indicates uh, the degree of inequality that we've come to now indicates uh, a kind of freezing up of a lot of mobility 
uh, structures that used to be there that are no longer there. And uh, I fear in the long run, macroeconomically, uh, it will make it a hard, to- hard to sustain the demand we need to keep an, uh, a market economy running. Tell, tell me about um, what you think some of the, some of the uh, um, impediments in the, in the mobility structure are, uh, so the freezing up that you, you mentioned, because that, that's really what interests me most, because what, what, I, what I'm most concerned about is that everybody has – uh, th- th- that everybody has a fair opportunity to really do well. Uh, and so what do you think those impediments are? Well, uh, uh, um, let me start first with the sure. nature of markets. Okay. Um, uh, if you listen to kind of um, what I call market fundamentalists, they think that you know markets are sent down from heaven by God and they exist as a state of nature. Yeah. But in in reality, you know, markets are social socially constructed things, and for most of human history, most of the interactions between human beings have occurred outside of markets. Markets mm-hmm. really have only risen to prominence in the last two hundred years. So it's not. Uh, so the real question is not, um, uh, uh, you know whether we're going to do a market or not, but right. what kind of a market do we want to construct and, and, and what are the rules of competition, what are the venues of competition, and uh, what kind of in- infrastructure do we create through combinations of public and private auspices to make the markets work. So any political economy, any market economy, uh, is based on rules uh, and, and of competition, property rights, uh, uh, contracts, all, all these things which are set by government. Uh, uh, and it's it's also clear historically that you can actually build processes of exclusion and uh, and uh, discrimination uh, into the structure of the market. This is what happened in uh, the South under Jim Crow, where uh, the basic uh, tenets of the political economy, the legal structure of the political economy, were set up to exclude and uh, exploit African Americans. Uh, so uh, our job is to make sure that the markets uh, are not exploitive and that they allow full participation, and more importantly, that people have the inputs that are needed to, to do well in the market. I think what um, uh, we found in our analysis at the end of uh, uh, Categorically Unequal is that increasingly inequality is structured around education and access to education, so that barriers to education, uh, and segregation is one of the most important of those, barriers to education uh, really become barriers to full participation in, in today's global economy and becomes a very important axis of stratification. We've mm-hmm. seen a decline in uh, stratification along the lines of gender and a rise in stratification along the lines of education. So education has really become the key resource, the key piece of human capital that uh, is, is playing a central role in today's stratification system. That that, that 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 comports well with uh, with uh, everything I've uh, read and what I what I've been uh, thinking these days. Uh, now, can, tell me what you think about um, issues about uh, uh, the American public school system. And uh, this is something that really concerns me. And this is one of those issues where I think there's some difference between uh, I think uh, uh, liberal-ish libertarians like myself and some uh, uh, um, sort of uh, more uh, conventional. Uh, welfare or egalitarian liberals in the U.S. is that I, I find the uh, system of public education in the United States to simply just be a sort of repeat the geographic segregation of people into sort of richer or poorer neighborhoods. So people who uh, live in uh, uh, poor urban neighborhoods have extremely uh, dysfunctional, low-quality schools, uh, which then, uh, you know, the primary education, which then prepares them – uh, fails to prepare uh, teenagers to get higher education. They're not in a position to uh, take advantage of higher educational opportunities, which more or less locks them into uh, lower, uh, uh, sort of uh, lower skilled jobs for the uh, course of their careers. And the question, the big question then is how to improve the quality of those schools so that more of those kids are prepared to... Uh, take advantage of higher education and the gains that come from getting it. And what I like things like school choice, uh, whether it's a voucher program or a tax credit uh, uh, sort of structure, that allows uh, 
people to that, that inject some level of competition into the uh, educational system so that there are incentives for the educational system to provide better quality education at lower prices, like markets tend to do in other goods. I don't see that there's anything special about education as a good that over time we shouldn't expect competition to improve the quality of education. Uh, so to me, that's a, an egalitarian uh, initiative to uh, implement school choice that would improve the educational options of uh, of uh, poor parents and students. Uh, wh what's your view on that? Well, I think uh, a lot of the failures in the education system actually originate in the housing market um, mm -hmm. because, as you point out, uh, the way we allocate education is largely spatial, largely geographic. Yeah. So if you've segregated people on the basis of race and income, uh, you've not only segregated the neighborhoods, you've segregated the school system. And uh, there's uh, a lot of evidence that uh, of ongoing uh, uh, racial uh, and ethnic discrimination in American housing markets that still needs to be addressed. Uh, and that's a, a basic uh, process of exploitation and, and exclusion that, that is persisting in American society that requires attention. So some of your educational reform actually has to come with a more uh, egalitarian and a, a more open housing market. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, I agree that it, 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 to the extent that you can build uh, competition into the provision of education, mm. it's a good thing. But I don't think you want to end up w uh, with a system that you, uh, where you ration education on the basis of price and ability to afford, because at the low end, obviously people aren't going to, uh, uh, not always able to afford uh, the, uh, the best education for their own children. Right. And so it really requires, a, it's a tricky formula to, mm -hmm. to so you don't want to uh, create a system where there are no incentives. Incentives do matter. But but at the same time, you don't want uh, uh, to m uh, ration education exclusively, uh, exclusively on the basis of price and ability to pay. And it's, it's how you work out that conundrum that is the $64,000 question. Mm -hmm. Uh, in general, I would say the American education system is is really kind of antiquated. Uh, on the one hand, um, uh, we have this uh, three months of summer vacation uh, that corresponds to an agrarian economy that no longer exists. Right. Uh, uh, I really believe we need to go to a 12-month uh, educational system with uh, with uh, periodic uh, breaks, you know, uh, yeah. to, to break up the year. But three months downtime during the summer makes no sense whatsoever in a post-industrial economy where the amount of knowledge, the amount of information you have to master is actually yeah. increased. Uh, moreover, it doesn't make sense to uh, end the earning, uh, learning process at 3 in the afternoon. I think you should have schools that maybe the intensive part of school goes till 3 in the afternoon or 2.30. But then a regular part of the education will be after school programs of various sorts mm -hmm. to, to keep the kids uh, engaged in, in uh, mind stimulating things, not, necessar not necessarily math or English or science, but art and music and extracurricular activities that could be part of the normal school day for all kids. And one thing we've discovered is that you know, poor families really have a hard time promoting the human capital development of, of their children. And so the extent that you can they keep kids in school all summer, keep kids in schools uh, for longer periods in the day, you're going to maximize the human pa capital production capability. And, and these are basic structural reforms, whether you have a public or a private educational system. Uh, we really uh, deliver education in a very outmoded way at this point. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why I'd like to see something that, that more closely approximates a market, because that would allow for there to be all sorts of variations in the nature of the service. So, uh, you know, if you had something more like a market in education, you could have schools that ran all year long, some that ran longer in the day, some that had different sort of mixes of uh, extracurricular activities with curricular activities. And the, 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 the selection process uh, over time is going to start identifying the, the, the package that best prepares students over time. And so one of the reasons why I think the system, I completely agree with you, one of the reasons I think it's antiquated is because there's nothing internal to the logic of the educational system that creates an advantage for those schools that adapt themselves better to the demand of the economy as it's sort of come down to us. Uh, and, and so I, I think... I'd like to see just more flexibility and the ability for experimentation because it's really hard to know in advance 
uh, what kind of structure is going to work well, I think you do need a kind of discovery process where, uh, you know, where, uh, where different alternatives just uh, knock around and you see what works. I agree, and um, public education tends to be fairly rigidly bureaucratized now, both um, from uh, the government side and from the union side. And I think uh, uh, somehow you need to knock through that bureaucracy to get more flexibility in, in current educational systems. The, the, uh, the, the dilemma I always come up with is trying to figure out how to do that in mm -hmm. a way that doesn't exclude people on the basis of ability to pay. So yeah. uh, uh, if you've got some thoughts on that, I'd be happy to hear them. Well, I, you know, I guess you could have a, a kind of a progressively graded uh, voucher system or something like that where, or if you're doing tax credits, the amount of the tax credit is going to be indexed to your uh, income. Uh, so there's basically, so you're making sure that uh, everyone has an equal ability to purchase uh, a certain level of education. Uh, so there's going to be a price of education that everybody is going to be able to afford uh, regardless of their uh, the, 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 their family income, uh, and uh, that and it, and it seems to me that it, if you if you're really concerned about structural inequality, that's uh, that's that that is one of the things that I think government can do well is to help equalize the means of access to the institution. It just doesn't strike me as something that the institution itself doesn't really need to be provided by the government. Uh, it seems like it, you just you just want to make sure that people have. Uh, uh, access, and I think that wh what people think about uh, a, a sort of a, a marketized education system depends a lot on their prior assumptions about how markets work. Um, and, and my own view, uh, which I'm arguing in my inequality paper, and I and, and and I see that this is something that most people don't agree with, is that markets have a uh, egalitarian upshot in the sense that they uh, that. Not in a nominal sense. Uh, markets do tend to produce uh, greater uh, income inequality over time, um, uh, absent any sort of corrective distribution. But uh, but what they uh, but they tend to improve the quality of goods uh, in general and have downward price pressures. And a lot of times, this advantages poorer people uh, more than it advantages uh, richer people. So if the quality of goods gets better faster at the bottom of the uh, sort of price range, then that's something that's going to um, be, uh, uh, be to the advantage of, of, uh, of less wealthy uh, individuals. Uh, so, I mean, I think you can see it across a large range of goods. So, uh, like household conveniences, the access that people have to microwaves and refrigerators and dishwashers and things like that, they've become very, very affordable, and most poor Americans have these things uh, while they didn't even 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, now, rich people have gigantic sub-zero built-in mm. refrigerators, but they're very functionally similar. It keeps your food cold. Uh, and so there's big differences in the sort of status signaling that, 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 uh, that higher-end consumption does. But the sort of functional quality of goods... I think tends to actually compress over time, and if you have that view, I think you'll you'll be more sanguine about a market in education, where what you'd expect, what I'd expect, is that the lower price education over time will tend to get to be higher and higher quality, and actually be less different from the uh, education that's available to the very wealthy than it is now. Why well, uh, some kind of earned income tax credit? For the educational system and uh, special incentives to, uh, for families to invest in education, I, I agree with you, be uh, uh, a smart policy and a way to go. Uh, and I agree that a properly structured market uh, tends to um, be um, populist and tends to produce uh, outcomes that are for the benefit of people even at the low end of the income distribution. Of course, the trick is getting a properly structured market. You can. <laughs> You can yeah. write. Uh, you can create a market with rules of competition that, with all the cards being held by elites and uh, other people being victimized constantly, even though they're competing as hard as they can, uh, and uh, that's the trick. Um, there's, there's a, a no, we're, we're, we've got a, about 12 minutes left, and uh, there's a lot else in your book that I'd like to talk about. But one thing that I, in, in particular, I'd like to. Uh, uh, talk to you about is uh, immigration. That's one of your specializations. In one of your chapters in the book uh, uh, on uh, on I think it's called uh, remaking or rebuilding a better underclass. 
right. is, is largely about immigration. And, uh, and uh, you participated in a, a Cato Unbound forum that we did on uh, Mexican immigration uh, uh, back in August of last year, I think it might have been. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to – this is obviously a, a fairly hot issue, uh, especially on the right, that the uh, candidates seem to be falling over each other trying to uh, be more uh, vehemently nativist and xenophobic. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I was wondering if you wanted to comment on, and I know you're, the reason you're here in Washington, D.C., is you were just at a, an, uh, a, an immigration conference uh, sponsored by the Wilson School and uh, by The Economist. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you see uh, the immigration issue right now in the U.S. Well, I think immigration is being used as a tool to reinforce processes of statification that um, that uh, people like you and I really don't want to see in a country like the United States. Uh, uh, the ongoing demonization of Mexicans uh, in general, uh, or in particular and immigrants in general, I, I find very disturbing. And you can see the consequences of of of, of this new pro, this new demonization going on. Uh, uh, the consequences of it playing out in uh, economic statistics. So what what we're seeing is a pretty sustained campaign by a lot of different actors mm -hmm. to move Mexicans and Latinos from one of these categories of esteemed in group and push them down into the despised out group category. Mm -hmm. And you can very clearly see this movement in when you do um, uh, some survey work and social and, and, and actually try to plot position of different groups in social cognitive space of, of American of American subjects. Uh, and uh, you see this, Lou Dobbs does it on a nightly basis mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in the media. Uh, Samuel Huntington does it in the academy. Yeah. And uh, uh, Pat Buchanan uh, d does it in, in kind of uh, the politics, political realm. And, uh, and that seems to be effect. Tom Tancredo's entire campaign is largely about yes. this. Yeah. Well, if you if you um, if you just listen to Lou Dobbs um, on a regular basis, you'd think that uh, the planes on 9/11 were piloted by Mexican pilots. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, of course, Mexico has nothing to do with the global war on terrorism. There aren't any. Um, terrorist cells in Mexico. So there aren't any Islamic populations in Mexico. There ha haven't been terrorist crossings from Mexico into the United States. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow the southern border of the United States has become uh, structured politically and symbolically as this mm -hmm. bulwark, this, this, wa this wall we have to defend against all these uh, evil people that are out to get us. Well, Doug, and, how, do you, uh, how do you address the main concerns that I hear coming from the uh, the anti-immigration right, which and I'll try to give what I think are the, the most sort of uh, charitable versions of the argument. Uh, the first is that Mexican immigrants uh, 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 compete with poor American workers and make them worse off. The second would be that uh, uh, Mexican immigrants, in particular, uh, tend to you get a lot of lone males who have high rates of crime and uh, and and just uh, Sort of, uh, and they're unsettled. They don't have families, so they're sort of ripe for uh, all sorts of social shenanigans. And then third, that these sort of influx of of uh, Mexicans into, say, the Amer American Southwest uh, threatens the cultural integrity uh, of those places. The the, 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 the the kind of Huntington idea that these institutions rest on a certain kind of Anglo-American culture, and that we really threaten. Uh, the, the sort of dis, the, we we threaten what makes the United States an attractive place to come to if we allow that culture to erode. Uh, like, how do you sort of tackle those objections? I mean, I, I that's a, uh, you'd need an hour to really tackle them all. But uh, well, uh, starting with the last one yeah. first, this kind of fear of cultural inundation and uh, particularly being swallowed up by Spanish. Um, first of all, there's no basis in fact for it. Uh, if you look at the data, there's this huge shift into English language. Uh, among immigrants, the longer they stay here, the more likely they are to speak English well. And then the biggest shift comes in the second generation with kids that were born or grew up in the States. Very quickly, English becomes their dominant language to the point by, where by the third generation, uh, they can't, they've lost the ability to speak Spanish. They've become monolingual like the rest of, uh, rest of America. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no really no basis, in fact, for this kind of fear that somehow we're going to be taken over. It so there's no assimilation problem? 
Um, I don't think there's an assimilation problem. Uh, there are, there's an ongoing uh, process of assimilation that's happening, and the, and, uh, uh, the immigrants themselves are not stupid. They understand that if you want to get ahead, not only in American society, but get ahead generally, learning English is one of the most valuable things you could do. So there are English language academies all over Mexico. Even in the smallest little town will have English mm -hmm. language academies. And in the United States, any, any um, English language a uh, program that you sell on television uh, gets uh, gets uh, bought in large numbers. Uh, English language classes are oversubscribed. There's a desperate demand to learn English um, among immigrants themselves. And uh, if you look at the world more generally, English has never been as hegemonic as it is today. Right. Uh, if you know, I, I, I marvel at Sam Huntington sitting up there in Cambridge, cowering in fear at the incursions of Spanish. I mean, <laughs> he should see what the world looks like in Mexico, where mm -hmm. you know Walmart's the biggest employer, uh, where uh, chain stores from the United States are moving in, where all the popular culture, all the movies come from Hollywood, where English language is infused in the daily Spanish spoken spoken there. Uh, English, uh, English is more hegemonic now than ever, and American popular culture is more hegemonic on the world stage than ever. So I just don't understand where this kind of fear comes from on the part of Americans. How about, how so, about, how about like crime and the persistence of Mexican-American poverty and things like that? Well, um, uh, uh, crime uh, has been raised as a, as a, a specter with every immigrant group that comes in. Uh, and if you look at the data uh, in, for the United States, immigrant neighborhoods have lower rates of crime than other neighborhoods. So the higher the percentage of foreign-born, other things equal, the lower the rate of crime. And, and immigrants aren't coming here to commit crimes. They're coming here as part of a mobility dream. They mm -hmm. want to improve their lives and improve themselves. And, and part of that is staying out of trouble in this country. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest problem is the buildup of the endocrine population in the United States. And one of the perverse effects of our militarization of the border with Mexico is that we had very little effect on the rate of in-migration. Because as dangerous as it is and as costly as it's become to cross the border, the chances are you're going to get in without dying. And the chances, uh, and it's going to cost you more, but it's still worth your while because you can work that off in a fairly short order. So, but... It's become a very unpleasant experience to cross the border, and the net, what's happened is that once people are in, they've decided to hunker down and stay rather than yeah. facing the gauntlet at the border again. And so uh, the net effect has been to, uh, uh, to reduce the rate of out-migration rather than lower the rate of in-migration. And, and, and so the perverse effect of our border policy has actually been to increase the rate of undocumented population growth in the United States. And now we've got this terrible situation where we have this unprecedented uh, number of immigrants in undocumented status. One, uh, one quarter of all immigrants in the United States are now out of status. One third of all Latin American immigrants are out of status. And one half of Mexican immigrants are out of status. And uh, this is the biggest single deterrent to integration and progress in the United States, the fact that these people are in uh, undocumented status. What do you the think of... Sorry, sorry. What, what, I, I, I wanted to mention real quickly. Uh, my uh, my partner Carrie Howley wrote a uh, cover for Reason Magazine uh, uh, this month uh, on guest workers, and she makes a really strong case for. Uh, she compares. Uh, she she goes and looks at uh, the uh, uh, guest worker program in Singapore, uh, which has a lot of uh, undesirable qualities to it, but uh, still people keep coming back because it's an opportunity of people from much poorer countries to participate in the labor markets of wealthier countries, uh, and there's th this idea of there being, we, one of the reasons why we don't want a guest worker program is that it would create a class of second class citizens who sort of work, you know, who, who uh, you know, water the greens at the golf club, but don't have all the benefits of citizenship. But it kind of sounds like what you're saying is that the status quo now is that we have sort of like lo locked in a group of people at, a, at, at even a lower legal status that you've got all these undocumented workers who really seriously don't have uh, rights to full participation. They don't have any legal right to work in the, uh, in the labor market. And the, and the way that we're policing the border makes it hard for them to return home at all. A guest worker program uh, would uh, at least allow people to just go back and forth from their home to their job, uh, wherever that might be. Do you have any, uh, do you have any worries about thing, like a, a large guest worker program 
creating a permanent inequality or stratification? Well, we couldn't possibly do any worse than we're doing now. We have the worst of all possible systems at this point. And um, your initial point about uh, 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 immigrants putting downward pressure on um, wages mm -hmm. and working conditions for, for less advantaged Americans is true, but that's because um, a, a growing share of these people are in illegal status and they're supremely exploitable. And now, we need the workers, we need the labor, uh, uh, but we don't want labor that is, by definition, completely exploitable. Mm -hmm. uh, and for this, you need uh, uh, to give them some kind of legal status. You make so, the point in your book that, there's that, that uh, in order to sort of shield themselves from uh, laws against hiring illegal immigrants, uh, a lot of employers will hire workers through contractors who then kind of bear the risk. The contractors then basically take a, you know, because they're bearing this risk of prosecution, they basically take a bigger cut out of the wages of their workers, but then that creates a downward pressure on legal workers who Absolutely. are lower skilled. So, so, the, so the process of making it uh, illegal to hire immigrant workers actually harms sort of native low skilled workers as well. Well, you can see this in the data. Um, uh, there were a whole round of studies based on a 1980 census done by George Borjas, who was the leader in this. And basically, the 1980 round of studies showed that uh, immigration had trivial effects on the status and welfare of American workers in almost all categories, and, and in some cases was actually positive. Uh, then, in 1986, the U.S. changed the law and criminalized undocumented hiring, and there's this massive shift in the labor market to indirect hiring through subcontractors. And this really did put a lot of downward pressure on uh, native uh, workers. And so, when the 1990 census results came out, suddenly there were all these effects there that weren't there before. And George Borjas, who before had kind of been a pro-immigrant guy, suddenly became an anti-immigrant guy, basing, mm -hmm. uh, using, based on his data, he was saying immigrants are doing all these terrible things. Well, Immigration was a constant. There was immigrants before, there were immigrants after, and there was a lot of illegal immigrants in both cases. But what changed was the terms of uh, hiring in the labor market and the sudden criminalization of illegal, of undocumented hiring. So uh, uh, I think the way to solve this is to get rid of the undocumented workers, and you do this by... Uh, a, setting up a guest worker program, because most people from Mexico in particular who come here, their goal is not to settle permanently. They're migrating and they temporarily to earn money to solve an economic problem at home, and they want to return home. So rather than frustrating their uh, uh, desire to return home by militarizing the border, we, we, should, we should just uh, regularize it and give them a temporary work visa. Now, my preference would be to give the, work, the visa to the worker. Mm -hmm. and to say, give them a, work, a visa that's good for two years that would allow them to come into the United States and pursue their opportunities with the same rights and privileges of other workers in the United States. That way they can't be exploited, and that way we have a very efficient market system for allocating labor supply and demand. Uh, you don't need a federal bureaucracy to mm -hmm. decide where the workers go. The markets will tell you. And, and the workers aren't stupid. They'll, they'll pursue their interests, and they'll have labor rights, and so can't be exploited. Well, you're uh, not going to get any argument from me. That sounds, uh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, I wish we uh, were that wise and that our political system was in a position to really seriously consider that kind of thing. But I'm afraid we've, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, there's uh, much more in your book uh, that I would like to discuss with you, uh, maybe another time. It's uh, Categorically Unequal, the American Stratification System. Uh, thank you, Professor Massey, for uh, talking to me. Well, that's great being here. Thank you for featuring the book. All right. Uh, take care now. Bye. Bye-bye.